Good afternoon. I am Dr. Shadi Vadat, uh, Chief Medical Officer at Create Cures Foundation. Thank you, Deborah, for the introduction. At our clinic in Santa Monica, I, along with the help of an amazing team of scientists, biologists, and dietitians, help patients use nutrition and fasting uh, in addition to integrative therapies to prevent and treat many different kinds of diseases and really feel amazing and empowered and knowledgeable in the process. Today, I'd like to show you how to catch health imbalances early so you can be more proactive in helping yourself and your loved ones not only lose weight, but to avoid debilitating chronic diseases down the road. Most likely many of you, especially since you've signed up uh, for this uh, Zoom class, um, have heard about fasting. In fact, it was the top diet search uh, of 2019 in Google and you might be wondering uh, from hearing from your friends and, and reading different things, is this just gonna be another weight lo loss fad? Um, in, in the past years, you've probably heard of Atkins diet or ketogenic diet or paleo diet. And is this just another new fad that we're gonna be talking about for a few years and then we'll move on to something else? Or is there any relevance in your health goals? So I'd like to mention that fasting is in fact a great tool for weight loss, but what I'm really hoping to impress upon you today is that it can be a powerful tool in prevention and sometimes reversal of many chronic diseases. And chronic diseases, as I'll show you in the next few slides, can cause significant disability, um, and suffering for many people for not only years, but sometimes decades. A good example of this is, is my own father. So here uh, is a picture of my dad. This week will uh, mark the one year anniversary since we lost him. Um, but the picture was taken uh, a year prior to his passing. And as you can see, he's in the hospital bed um, on his birthday. We're celebrating uh, you know, together and his last probably couple of years, we were frequent visitors um, at UCLA hospitals and probably on a monthly basis, he was getting admitted. So it was a pretty rough course and I'll just go through when his battle with heart disease started. Um, so he, he, from the time I was probably around nine or 10 years old, uh, that's when I recall that he started having chest pains and had his first heart attack at age 45. Um, by the time that he was 55, he'd already had two cardiac arrests. And I clearly remember one day while in college, uh, having to drive him to the Oakland emergency room um, to get help. He, he survived that arrest, however, by the age of 60, he required a heart bypass. And ultimately there were many complications post-operatively and he developed heart failure um, with a lot of breathing problems. And in fact, by the age of 70, the doctors uh, were pretty much um, done with uh, being able to help him. They were talking about uh, the fact that we, there was nothing more to do for him. Uh, they put him on a blood thinner and send him home without any monitoring. Of course, having a physician daughter who was a hospital doctor. And at that point, I was already interested in integrative medicine. I was able to advocate for him. And he was able to get a pacemaker safely by age 75 for his atrial fibrillation. But ultimately, he started having multi organ failure. And by age 77, his kidneys started failing. By age 78, he had complete liver cirrhosis. And again, he didn't have any other medical problems. This is just from heart disease. Um, so the, these are the consequences. And ultimately, uh, two to three years before passing, uh, sadly, he had to start on dialysis. So, so my very tough, strong father was having these huge needles put into his arm to try to dialyze him. And, and he went through all of that uh, like a trooper. But like I said, again, these types of chronic diseases can be debilitating. You know, uh, if people have heart attacks or strokes in their sleep and pass comfortably, 
that that is uh, that is uh, easier to accept. But to see someone um, slowly decline over many decades is quite difficult for the patient and the caregivers around him. So let's go to statistics and in terms of what are the leading causes of death, the most uh, uh, the most current availability on on the CDC website is this chart from 2016 to 2017. But in fact, uh, over the years, there's really not much of a difference. The number one killer, both in the United States and globally, is still heart disease. As you can see, um, that is the top line. It is closely followed by cancer. And those two are pretty much neck and neck. And other conditions like lower respiratory diseases, strokes, Alzheimer's, diabetes, kidney disease rank much lower. So this is, this is sort of what is common, but I wanna bring your attention to what has happened in 2020 since the pandemic. In fact, this, uh, the leading cause of death this past year has changed a bit. And while, and this chart is actually taken from February to May, 2020, I'm sure, uh, just coming from a hospital shift this last weekend, if you were probably going to put a more current chart, uh, the COVID numbers would probably be much higher than that. But as you can see, heart disease and cancer is still up there, but you're having COVID uh, surpass many of those other conditions being the third uh, common cause of, of, of deaths uh, in the US. And the reason I point this out is because let's dive a little bit deeper into who is at risk for serious complications from COVID. So heart disease and cancer, as we've talked about, rank at the top, um, but the types of pre-existing conditions that will increase the chance for you to have serious consequences from a COVID infection still go back to heart disease, cancer, obesity, or severe obesity and type two diabetes. So again, I, I bring this to your attention because I think there's no better time than now to really get serious about lifestyle interventions. The good news is that, uh, unfortunately, I wish I had a pointer so I could explain this graph to you, but I will do my best to do it verbally. Um, this graph was taken from a study looking at life expectancy and how it changes when there is addition or implementation of healthy lifestyle factors and what happens to life expectancy. So um, if you look at the top, this is showing women uh, and, and their life expectancy. The lower graph is men. Men are a few years behind women. Uh, the average now for men is around 76, 78 years old uh, is average life expectancy for women around 80 or 81. Um, so the, the, the bar at the far left uh, is demonstrating life expectancy if there's no uh, low risk lifestyle factors. So again, that goes to about uh, the age of 76 or so for men and, and 81 for women. Now, as the bars go to the right, there is addition of lifestyle factors that reduce your risk of chronic diseases. So if you add one healthy lifestyle habit, you will gain a couple of extra years in terms of life expectancy. So let's say you uh, implemented a healthy diet and exercise. So those would be two low risk lifestyle factors. Again, you're getting a few extra years in terms of extending life expectancy. And at the far right, um, all the way to the right, you'll see that's the highest bar. And that represents if you are doing four or five different uh, healthy lifestyle factors, I'll go into that in the next slides, you will get about 10 to 12 years extension of life expectancy. And in that top purple part, that's showing if you were diagnosed with cancer, heart disease, or type two diabetes, yes, your total life expectancy is a little bit less, but you still benefit greatly uh, in terms of uh, extension of life expectancy. Now, what are those in this study with the chart? What were those lifestyle factors that mattered the most? So they looked in the study at optimal nutrition and I've added some extra comments to bring your attention to what factors based on our um, team's work have been shown to be most impactful 
limiting simple sugars, refined sugars uh, and carbohydrates, limiting excess protein, uh, which, is, which actually increases the risk for diabetes and cancer, especially animal protein. These are really important factors when you're trying to optimize nutrition optimal body weight. And in the next slides, I will go through how to figure out body mass index. Uh, how much alcohol intake you have per day is really important. It's considered another low risk lifestyle factor that is helpful. And we'll go into the following slides into what it means to have moderate alcohol intake. Moderate sounds like it's a lot, but actually it's not that much as I'll show you in the next slide. Um, the amount of alcohol that is uh, considered um, low risk is a little bit different for men and women. Men can have a little bit more. And, and I'll demonstrate that in the next slides. Being a lifelong non-smoker is also helpful, but even if there's a limited number of years that can still help. Physical activity was defined in this study as um, about three and a half hours per week of moderate to vigorous intensity activity. And that averages to about getting 30 minutes a day. So again, going back, if you uh, worked on you know, uh, optimal nutrition and exercise, let's say just two lifestyle factors, you would be looking at that middle bar and life expectancy for a woman would go up from 81 to maybe 86 years old. Uh, and if you implemented all those things, exercise, nutrition, non-smoker, and moderate alcohol, you are getting close to 90 years of age. Now, I just wanna take maybe a few seconds now, you probably all have access on your computer or your phone to punch in this website. I would like you um, right now, I'll give you a few seconds to calculate your body mass index. It is not a perfect tool, but it's often used in studies to see if you're in the optimal range. And so if you punch in www.calculator.net slash BMI dash calculator dot HTML, it is based on your height and weight and you are going to get a number and you can see that the ideal normal range of BMI is about on this chart, 18 and a half to 25. And in the previous chart that where we were looking at life expectancy, they considered anything under a BMI of 25 as a low risk uh, lifestyle factor. And then BMIs of 25 to 30 are considered overweight and obesity is considered uh, to be at a BMI of greater than 30. And there is actually a further uh, um, classification that's not on this chart, but that would be defined as severe obesity. So hopefully just within that calculation, you have some idea of what your personal risk is as we're going through this talk. And what I've done in these slides is to really kind of tease out those uh, lifestyle factors that are important so that you can really get some tangible information. So when we're talking about moderate alcohol intake, again, moderate maybe would be six, you know, five glasses of wine to some people, but no, in fact, um, the way they calculate that is based on the volume of the alcohol and the percentage uh, of alcohol in a particular drink. So because beer has less percent alcohol, that's why you can afford to have a little bit more. But this is for a woman. So for a woman, what is considered in that study to be acceptable alcohol intake is either 12 ounces of beer, which I think is a bottle of beer, I'm not sure how much the cans are, or four to five ounces of wine or one and a half ounces of hard liquor. So this is maximum in a day, which as you can see is not that much. And for a male, it's approximately double this. So a man uh, would be able to have 24 ounces of beer, um, 
you know, eight to 10 ounces of wine and three ounces of hard liquor. We also looked at, um, again, and this is based on the study that, that I showed uh, and life expectancy, how much, when they're talking about exercise, what are we talking about? How much and for how long uh, do you need to exercise? So by, by guidelines of, from Department of Health and Human Services, this is what is recommended. Moderate exercise, aerobic exercise, and you want to kind of these these numbers here are just where a baseline of what you want to meet. Now, if you are severely obese or diabetic, um, or you have other health conditions, you probably may need to do a little bit more than this. But for the average person without a lot of health problems, you're looking at the recommendations being for moderate aerobic exercise, 150 minutes per week. So that would be, you know, around 30 minutes, five days a week. What is classified as moderate aerobic exercise would be uh, brisk walking, that's kind of considered around uh, a little bit greater than four miles per hour, swimming, mowing the lawn. I'm not sure if anyone in LA mows their lawn, but uh, you know that, that is uh, considered moderate aerobic exercise. Gardening falls under this or a slow jog. Or you can, if you're doing more vigorous aerobic exercises, then the requirement, total requirement falls to 75 minutes per week. And these would be things like climbing stairs, running, aerobic dancing, playing soccer, or doing um, a brisker bicycle ride. Um, so about bicycling more than 12 miles per hour. So, you know, you should ideally sort of uh, combine some moderate aerobic exercise with bursts of vigorous uh, for, for ideal conditions. You also want to make sure as, as, as we're all getting older to add strength training uh, two to three times a week by using weight machines or uh, your own body weight. Again, sort of going into a little bit more detail in terms of what uh, to, to, I, to highlight for you things that are relevant and things that may increase your personal risk of chronic diseases. Um, there's a lot of studies looking at various numbers and, and physical findings. A higher waist circumference has been associated uh, with, with greater mortality. So in men, if your waist circumference is more than 40 inches or for women 35 inches, that actually increases your risk of diabetes, high blood pressure, and coronary artery disease, and doubles your risk of premature death. So ideally, you want to aim for a number somewhere around 33 inches for men and 27 inches for females. Other things that increase risk of chronic diseases are diet high in animal and saturated fats uh, and sugars. Uh, excessive total calories or empty calories that don't provide nutrients. I want to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about excess stress because most people think that is mental or emotional stress that I'm talking about. But I always have to share with patients that there's um, the body doesn't know the difference between mental, emotional, and physical stressors. They all have the same impact. They all secrete um, unwanted chemicals into the body that creates damage. Um, uh, to all, all, all parts of our uh, body, our immune system, our uh, metabolism. So when you're, when you're talking, when you're thinking about stress, also think about the physical changes that, that are essentially stressors to the body. And physical stressors would be things like inadequate sleep, uh, skipping meals and blood sugar fluctuations, or uh, smoking. So these are physiologic stressors that in fact are no different than uh, mental, emotional uh, stress uh, or you know, fighting with your neighbor. So um, being mindful of all of those is important. Poor sleep, as I kind of mentioned earlier with stress, disrupted sleep, waking up a lot to, to go to the bathroom, sleep apnea where you're actually not getting sufficient oxygen is a huge stressor uh, on the heart and lungs. Um, even people, uh, there's tons of studies on night shift workers or some nurses that have, uh, you know, work at night but are sleeping during the day. These are all going to increase your chance of, of chronic disease and especially there's been a link with night shift workers having increased chances of cancers. So 
Sleep is pretty important. Now, I want to spend a little bit of extra time talking about uh, blood biomarkers because uh, I really want to get you all um, aware uh, of the numbers that you could be looking for the next time your doctor orders labs for you. I think far too often primary care physicians and general practitioners are not bringing, uh, bringing up or bringing to your attention the numbers that are ideal. Oftentimes when I see patients, uh, people will say, oh, I just had my annual and uh, you know, my doctor said everything looks good. To which I quickly say, well, what is good for you know, your doctor may not be good enough for me. <laughs> so when we're looking at labs, we're always really looking at optimal, not just for you to fall in the normal range of what the lab says. You know, and again, people think, well, last year the doctor said I didn't have diabetes, but you know, basically what, what they're waiting for is for the, for the um, number to go into a certain range and the lab will tag it as being abnormal. And you know, then they'll say, okay, now you have diabetes, let's, let's start metformin. So what you wanna appreciate is that people don't go from being totally healthy to diabetic in one year or in six months, this is a continuum. So usually what happens is that over several years, your blood sugars may be going up slowly. And I put this 65 to 99 because I'd like you to pay attention next, next time your doctor does a fasting blood sugar and to see if you notice the, the lab writes that anything, if this is fasting, anything between 65 and 99 is uh, normal. So if you were 98, uh, nobody would have a problem with that. <laughs> but is that really optimal? So if you were over 99 and if you were between 100 to 126, we would call you, uh, we would kind of consider that as a pre-diabetic, uh, you know, fasting blood sugar. And then if you were above 126, you know, we would say that's, that's in the diabetic range. So when you are looking at your fasting labs, in fact, I'd like the blood sugar to be closer to 80. Or if you have cancer or heart disease, I may even want tighter regulation. So you never want to be sort of waiting till you're 98 or 102 before you implement lifestyle interventions. Now, total cholesterol. Cholesterol is a more complex conversation, which um, I'll just touch on briefly, but it can go both ways. I think a lot of times doctors are not alerting people when the cholesterol is too low, and we do need adequate cholesterol to make hormones. And, and you know, it is a part of our immune system. Uh, everyone is focused on too high of a cholesterol and not all high cholesterol is a problem either. Typically when I'm evaluating cholesterol, I'm getting much more detailed biomarkers to see is the total cholesterol or the total LDL really a problem or is it really a risk because there's different types of LDL. Some are not as problematic and won't clog the arteries in the heart and others are fine. So when I see a high cholesterol, it's not panic time necessarily, but it prompts further investigation to see if you're really at risk. Another number that I don't see um, measured too often, but I think it's nice to have your doctor order it is a highly sensitive CRP, which is a nonspecific marker of inflammation. And I, this is a routine lab that I do uh, for my new patients, but what it's looking for is just inflammation in the body. And we know that whatever or wherever the inflammation is coming from, it is going to put you at a, at increased risk for problems down the road. And again, kind of like what we were talking about with blood sugars, if, if your number is under three, the lab doesn't even tag it, doesn't highlight it, doesn't make it look red. So, you know, your doctor may say, I mean, they're probably not checking it, but if they do check it, they wouldn't bring it to your attention that, well, it looks like we really need to uh, make some changes. And so while one to three um, is considered optimal and anything over three is considered abnormal, I really advise my patients to try to keep it under one to keep uh, chronic diseases at, at bay. The other thing to look at is elevated blood pressure. Of course, some people have the white coat syndrome and whenever they go to their doctors, they, they are, you know, have much higher blood pressures than they do at home. 
it is uh, if you have a good blood pressure cuff at home uh, that's reliable, that's ideal to check your blood pressure at rest after you've gotten up in the morning and after you've gone to the bathroom, that's when I like to have, have my patients check. And ideally, we want to be somewhere around a systolic blood pressure of 120 and diastolic of 80. When I went to med school, that number was, uh, you know, 140 over 90. But, but again, you don't want to wait till it's sort of at the fringes of normal range. Now, what about fasting? So what have the studies, both animal and human, shown us so far in terms of what they can help with? Uh, I kind of combine the animal and human studies, but on the left-hand column, it's mostly what's been seen in animal models. On the right, it's uh, more relevant to what has been tested in humans. So uh, fasting, and this is kind of clumping together all different types of fasting, um, you know, shorter, longer, but in animals, fasting has been shown to increase the animal's lifespan. It does help with loss of belly fat. It does help with decreased bone mineral density loss. It's been shown to do really well for inflammatory conditions, especially inflammatory skin conditions. Um, when they look at neurodegenerative models in, in uh, mice and animals, uh, fasting has improved their cognitive motor coordination and brain function. Um, there's, uh, uh, it looks like there's, um, fasting does help the immune system. Uh, as we age, the immune system gets a little bit more sluggish and uh, ineffective, but fasting can help get rid of bad immune cells and uh, create healthier ones to protect us. Uh, there has been evidence of tumor size reductions with fasting. In humans, uh, and these studies are growing um, and will continue as the years uh, go on, but we, we have seen um, uh, fasting impact weight loss, blood sugar control, blood pressure reduction, cholesterol reduction. And very importantly, this is again, another marker that I sometimes check on patients, especially if they're at higher risk for cancers we look at something called insulin-like growth factor. Uh, it has been associated if elevated with a higher risk for breast, prostate, and other cancers. Uh, and again, triglyceride reduction is another benefit. So where do you start? You've probably heard all different types of names, intermittent, time-restricted feeding, um, water fast, and perhaps some of you have even heard of fasting mimicking diet. So I want to touch on what all of these different ones are. Uh, intermittent fasting, um, the name uh, usually uh, is reserved for fast where you're having a regular, um, you're cycling regular days of eating with fasting days. So alternate day fast is one day you eat normal, then the next day you fast, and then you keep alternating. So let's say Monday you ate regularly, whatever you wanted. Tuesday, you're fasting the entire day for 24 hour period. Then Wednesday, you're eating regularly and uh, so forth. So you keep alternating every other day. Sometimes a modification on the alternate day fast is you eat regularly Monday and instead of eating nothing, water is usually allowed. Instead of eating nothing or just water, you can have a modified alternate day fast where you're only getting 500 to 600 calories. Um, it's 500 calories for women, 600 for men. Um, so that, that's alternate day fasting. There's something called a 5-2 fasting uh, protocol, which usually means out of the seven days of the week, you're eating normally uh, five days of the week, and then you're picking two non-consecutive days to fast. So maybe you would fast for 24 hours on Monday and Thursday, and the rest of the week you're eating regularly. So that those uh, that's usually intermittent fasting. Time-restricted feeding, uh, uh, is usually in reference to what you're doing every day. Um, if you're gonna restrict food for 12, 14 or 20 hours a day um, and do this daily, you, you really do at least need to do it four to five days out of the week for it to be effective. Other, otherwise it's not going to have the metabolic uh, impact that you'd like it to. Um, and so a lot of people are doing 16 hour fast, 14 hour fast uh, and trying to um, uh, control weight or other metabolic factors that way. There is a better and less better way of doing this. 
uh, but uh, maybe I'll touch on that on future slides. There are people that talk about or have done water fast. If you're doing water fast of two days to several weeks, really this should be reserved for an inpatient or monitored setting. You should not be attempting to do water fast uh, on your own at home because you can have significant electrolyte imbalances and it could be quite dangerous. Fasting mimicking diets, uh, possibly some of you have heard about that. These are diets that um, essentially um, you are consuming some food and it's usually plant-based foods um, for five days. Um, and you're consuming some, some food, but it's actually designed so that the food is in such a ratio that your body thinks you're fasting for five days. So it tricks the body. That's why it's called fasting mimicking diet. So you actually eat, but the body thinks that uh, you have uh, fasted for five days. Now I wanna touch uh, before we go into how might you pick what type of fasting is optimal for you. I wanna go through what uh, actually happens because you're, what, what you're trying to do and the goals that you're trying to meet are gonna be different. Um, and how long you fast is gonna be different depending on what you're trying to achieve. So let's say you have a meal and 48 hours after uh, this meal is being processed, insulin is secreted from the pancreas and your blood sugar is high right after the meal, but it starts falling over that four to eight hour period. At 12 hours of fasting, you actually, the, the blood sugar is falling, you have some hormones increase, growth hormone increases, uh, which is actually very important for muscle growth. At 13 to 16 hours, so this is kind of like the time-restricted feeding that we were talking about. And it's these numbers and these hours are very different for different people. So these numbers are not exact. So for one person, when they switch from sugar to fat is gonna be maybe at 16 hours. For another person, it might happen at 12 hours. So these are general guidelines. But around this time, your body switches from burning sugar to starting to break down your fat for fuel. And so that's kind of our ultimate goal is to try to get that fat, uh, which is unhealthy and inflammatory to break down. And so instead of the body using sugar for fuel, it switches to using fat. And so uh, our, our brain is one of uh, part of the body that really loves uh, you know, to use sugar and glucose uh, but once you kind of fast a little bit longer, it can transition to use fat breakdown molecules. Ketones, you may have heard, are one of these byproducts. And there's great healing uh, um, effects from ketones on the brain and on the rest of the body. Um, so around 20 to 24 hours of fasting, you're getting something called autophagy starting. It's really hard to measure autophagy. Um, so so basically we suspect that this process happens around 24 hours. And why is this important? Autophagy is, is in reference or means uh, it, it eating your own tissues. So what happens around 24 hours of fasting is the body has a mechanism because it doesn't have nutrients and it's not getting calories from anywhere else. So it starts eating up the bad and damaged cells in your own body and recycling those proteins and amino acids. So it's kind of like a cleanup mechanism to get rid of unhealthy cells or precancerous cells or damaged cells. So, so you really do need to go a little bit longer if you want to start to get to this period. But really we think autophagy just barely begins at the 24 hour mark. And as you're going toward the second day or third day of fasting, it really ramps up. Also around 24 hour studies show that there's uh, evidence of intestinal stem cell regeneration. So for people who have a lot of gut related issues or colitis uh, or anything like that, or autoimmune conditions related to uh, kind of like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, you know, if you're going to use fasting to help with those conditions, uh, you, you know, you're really getting some benefits around 24 hours, inflammation drops, and you also get rise in BDNF, which are just chemicals that are really helpful for neuron regeneration and, and brain health. Uh, at around 36 hours, you're really starting to use up stored sugars, and your body 
while uh, in the initial phases of fasting is more in a sympathetic or fight or flight side of the nervous system, it starts actually changing into a calmer part of the nervous system, which is called parasympathetic. Um, and so you will have things like improved bowel motility and a reduction in inflammation. At around 72 hours and longer, you're really having maximum healing and repair. Uh, autophagy is kicked up uh, to a peak. There's immune rejuvenation, stem cell rejuvenation, and really you're getting the, not only the metabolic improvements, but a lot of the uh, deeper um, healing and repair. So how are you gonna choose which type of fasting is appropriate for you? Um, these ones on this page, intermittent fasting and time-restricted feeding, are the ones that are usually for most people uh, the safest. You probably could get away with trying them uh, if you don't have a lot of health conditions without seeing the doctor or doing labs. Um, of course, if you have heart disease or um, you have a serious health condition, you shouldn't do any of these without checking with your doctor first. But generally, they're safer than, than the more prolonged fast. Intermittent fasting, as we talk about, is the alternate day fast and the 5-2 fast. You're going to think about doing, well, all of the fasting on this page, um, only if your main interest is weight loss, uh, improving insulin sensitivity, maybe reducing blood pressure. Uh, th this is when uh, reducing inflammation. So this is what these shorter fasts are good for. The problem with um, alternate day fast or 5-2 fast is really compliance. It's really difficult, as you can imagine, to do alternate day fast for months and years on end. Uh, people usually don't stick with it that long. Um, the other problem is that these kind of shorter fasts may not be sufficient to drive down uh, um, glucose and blood sugar in very overweight patients. So you may need to do more to if you're having trouble, you know, or if you're a more advanced diabetic. So, um, so there's limited benefit. Um, but again, sort of the ease uh, which, with which they can be implemented uh, doesn't require a lot of um, monitoring. Whereas in the more prolonged fast for more serious health conditions, uh, you definitely, definitely should um, get a knowledgeable uh, doctor on your team who can guide you. We, at our clinic, we don't advise on prolonged water fast because as I mentioned, you can have um, significant um, symptoms and electrolyte shifts that can put you at risk. So there are clinics where you can stay there and do these longer uh, water fast under observation. And those would be from anywhere between a few days to a few weeks. Um, now fasting mimicking diets is, is a much safer way to go about this. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, if you look on the internet, there are different types of products available uh, that are classified under fasting mimicking diets. Generally, there are five days of plant-based foods. As I mentioned, these diets were designed with certain nutritional ratios in mind so that you're eating between 800 to 1200 calories but because of the way that the, the nutrients are combined, your body does not register it as food. So it thinks that it has fasted for five days. And as you saw from the previous slides, you're getting a, a lot more benefit when you're at day three, four, and five. So for those serious conditions, this would be one option uh, to consider. It certainly is very helpful and the studies our team has done have shown impressive results with the metabolic numbers, blood sugar, cholesterol, inflammation, blood pressure coming down. But um, you know, again, for the type of patients we see with serious autoimmunity or cancer or with chemotherapeutics, this would be the better option to go. And the nice thing about it, as you remember when I said alternate day fasting or 5-2 fasting, you're doing, you're going to have to do those, uh, you know, on a regular basis to get benefit. What is nice about the fasting mimicking diet is that what has been seen in, in the studies, again, from our team is that if you do these sort of uh, 
uh, fasting periods, which last five days out of the month, you're just doing it five days out of one month, and then you're resuming your regular diet. Now, that doesn't mean you're overeating the other 25 days, but if you, uh, when they have looked at studies, looking at people doing the fasting mimicking diet once a month or for, for three months, they have seen that all those metabolic numbers, blood sugar, cholesterol, inflammation, blood pressure continue to stay under control even when you're back on your regular diet. So that's the nice thing uh, is that you're, you're doing these boluses of five days out of the month or quarterly and it's keeping things in check. Now, what do we know about fasting mimicking studies? Uh, we have seen in animal studies, um, these are some of the findings that have been done specifically well, with fasting mimicking, 45% uh, reduction in cancer, reduction in inflammation, and when there is cancer, reduced death from it in animal models when uh, there's been cycles of FMD, uh, which is short for fasting mimicking diets. Uh, there's slower progression of Alzheimer's and Parkinson disease and other neurodegenerative conditions. Um, there's uh, impressive uh, results in multiple sclerosis. There's not only reduction in the autoimmunity and damage and improvement in symptoms, but there's actually remyelination um, that is quite exciting uh, in animal models of, of inflammatory bowel disease or Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Um, there's, there seems to be excellent reduction of colon inflammation and intestinal cell regeneration. If you remember, I said that that starts kicking in at 24 hours, but you're getting max effect after four or five days. Um, additionally, as we age, we start making unhealthy, as, as you remember, I said that the uh, stem cells and the bloodline and all of that can get a little confused and make unhealthy uh, blood cells that can become cancerous. So doing fasting mimicking diets has been uh, shown in animal models to reduce certain types of myeloid blood cancers like CML. And one of the most exciting findings uh, that we've seen with FMD is that in early type one diabetics, you can actually have a rejuvenation and regeneration of pancreatic beta cells, uh, which in turn will mean that you will need much less insulin if it's caught early. What of the um, human studies with fasting mimicking studies uh, have shown that uh, within the, the five days that it's implemented, typically uh, people lose five to seven pounds. There's a specifically loss of visceral or belly fat. That kind of fat is much more dangerous and increases your chance of heart disease down the road. Um, but interestingly, not only is lean body mass preserved, so you're not losing protein, and there's actually a little bit of an increase in muscle mass from some of the studies. So, and I do these uh, fasting mim mimicking diets uh, somewhere around four to six times a year myself. And I've actually tested this, uh, you know, in, in terms of where the weight loss is coming from, majority of it is fat loss. And I have never had reduction in muscle mass, which is what you're looking for. You don't want to lose muscle. Um, if you remember, I talked about insulin growth factor one, which uh, is a marker for cancer risk. Um, and again, if you have family history of cancer or you're at risk for other reasons, then this, this type of fasting can, can be really helpful and effective for reduction, reduction of this marker. Uh, and inflammation drops, uh, blood pressure typically drops about six millimeter per uh, mercury. So, um, and like you remember, I said, when you do the five days, these changes persist even when you're back on your regular diet. How often you should do them kind of depends on the severity of illness and disease and your goals. Uh, we see a lot of patients with um, different stages of cancer from early cancer to, um, to metastatic disease on various kinds of chemotherapeutics or immunotherapy. And uh, there's beautiful studies showing that combining fasting mimicking diet with chemotherapy shows uh, not only, uh, is not only safe, but actually people have less side effects from chemo and the clinical response in terms of cancer is improved when uh, these, these diets are combined or these fasting uh, cycles are combined 
with therapies. And, and we certainly help a lot of people in that regard. Um, studies with FMD, and uh, there's a small study, a human study, looking at multiple sclerosis patients, uh, measuring quality of life measures and symptoms. And just after one cycle, just after five days, that's it. Uh, there was pretty uh, nice improvement in symptoms. So, you know, these people didn't need to do it uh, six times a year, but even with one cycle, uh, they did benefit. Uh, blood sugar reduction, cholesterol reduction, and there's plenty of uh, human studies ongoing now in the conditions at the bottom of the page. You may be wondering uh, if there are people who should not do this. Again, uh, if whatever type of fasting, it's important to check with your doctor to see if you're safe to do it. But if uh, a lot of these are specific to the longer fast or the fasting mimicking diet, if you have an eating disorder, active infection, you're underweight, breastfeeding or pregnant, um, you're below age 18 or senior over 70, or you have a serious condition with a lot of prescription medications, you should not do these uh, without the guidance of a practitioner. Um, um, Dr. Uh, Scott, yeah. I'm, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Let me just let everybody know. We only have about 10 minutes left. So if you do have a question, uh, the best thing, some people are saying they can't see the chat or get into the chat. Uh, you can text me on my cell phone at 424 385-4875, 424-385-4875, and I can read the question out. If we do run out of time, go ahead and include your email with the question, and Dr. Vedat, uh, we will chat about it and get your answer and get it to you via email if we don't have enough time here. I know a lot of people are on their lunch hour, but um, so interesting, and I know a lot of people have questions. I'm getting some via text, so be sure to text me and include your email. That that way we can make sure your question gets answered. Thank you so much. Deb, Deb huh? uh, I only have uh, two, three, four, I think just four slides left. And these are just uh, more uh, on the, um, you know, what our team has found to, to be conducive for our, an optimal diet in between fasting. Do you want me to kind of breeze through this quickly? So we have maybe five minutes for questions or yeah. should we? That would be great. That would be great. And I think if anybody has questions, I, I have our email clinic email at the end. So please, please uh, let us know. We'd be happy to um, send you answers. Uh, so again, what, what our, our team of scientists have worked on for many years is figuring out from a lot of basic research, uh, looking at centenarians and people living to 100 years or older, they've really studied what type of diet uh, has been helpful for longevity and prevention of chronic diseases. And what we've come up with is that eating mostly a vegan diet or pescatarian, should, should I say, uh, with seafood two to three times per week uh, is, is ideal. Um, you wanna pick fish that are low mercury and have high um, uh, omega-3s for their anti-inflammatory benefits. So wild salmon, anchovies, sardines, cod, sea bream, you can see that. Um, again, what, uh, what our team has, uh, has realized is that if you are below the age of, um, or what they have researched is that for people below the age of 65, keeping the protein intake very low is important. If you remember earlier in the talk, I talked about insulin growth factor one, um, which is a cancer risk marker. It, it has been shown that when people eat a lot of protein, and especially animal protein, the IGF levels do, IGF-1 levels do increase. So it, it is not um, things like uh, diabetes and cancer risk go up. So if you're below the age of 65, you really need to calculate what is the optimal protein intake for you. We do that when you work with our team and our dietitian. Uh, again, um, at our clinic, we're asking people to record their diet and we really analyze it to great detail. We look at your total calories. We look at the breakdown. We make sure you're getting enough healthy fats. We make sure that you're not overdoing it or underdoing it with the protein. And this uh, slide gives you some uh, idea where you wanna be, 0.31 to 0.36 grams per pound of body weight. So for a person, who's 130 pounds, it's somewhere between 40 to 47. For a maybe 200 pound person, it's, it's closer to 60 grams of protein, ideally plant-based sources. If you are older, 
If you're older than 65, that means you can or and should increase the protein above that because it's been shown to be better for longevity and longevity and health. So we do allow our patients over 65 to have um, more fish, eggs, white meat, and, and consume some cheese from goat or sheep uh, sources. Uh, the, again, plant-based sources I mentioned. Um, you wanna minimize saturated fats, especially from animal sources. Lots of high quality vegetables, not spinach and kale over and over and over, but a rainbow of colors, tomatoes, broccoli, cabbage, uh, different, different, you know, diversify. Uh, generous amounts of healthy olive oil, three tablespoons a day, nuts. Um, and again, based on your weight, age, abdominal circumference and your health uh, conditions, we decide if it's, uh, or we can help patients decide if it's better for you to have two meals a day uh, with, a, with a small snack, or if you're underweight, you should probably be, be having more like three meals a day. Uh, so ideally you would have a breakfast and lunch and, and a light dinner. We're much more insulin sensitive, uh, you know, earlier in the day. So if you're going to have a carbohydrate meal, we like it sort of shifted to earlier in the day. You want to maximize com complex carbohydrates, vegetables, beans, um, and and reduce your consumption of not paste, but pasta. <laughs> that was an error. Sorry, pasta, rice, bread, and sugar. Uh, more healthy fats, and really at a minimum, try to confine your eating to a 12 hour period. So start at 8 a.m. and have your last bite at 8 p.m. That does not mean you can have snacks at 11 p.m. Don't eat anything within three to two, uh, three to four hours of bedtime. Again, uh, patients that work with us, we really get into the nitty gritty. We look and make sure you're getting enough vitamins. If not, or if there's deficiencies, we may suggest multivitamins or supplements. Um, depending on your health risk, uh, implementing fasting mimicking diets uh, may be worthwhile. Uh, we talked about exercise uh, and strength training, and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Deb. Um, I put the clinic email down below, and I know we okay. have five minutes. Okay, it's also in the chat. And again, you can text me and we can get that information to you. Uh, just a quick disclaimer, we are a nonprofit. So as uh, Dr. Badat mentioned, we don't talk about product. When she mentioned there are products out there, we have no connection with, um, you know, our clinic is not part of that. So just to let you know, um, it's something that you would be searching for. But uh, we are a nonprofit, but there are things that uh, you can locate on your own that we are not able to promote or talk about. So just that disclaimer. Uh, real quickly, questions. We have great questions coming in, 424-385-4875. Uh, so this question is, how do you know when blood sugar falls after eating? I'm entering an area of pre-diabetic. How do you know if it falls too low? Is that? After eating. So how do you know? What's what's a symptom maybe, or how would you know that your blood sugar falls yeah. after eating? So, so a lot of people have this uh, confusion. I, I A lot of times I will hear, oh, my blood sugar drops or I get hypoglycemic. But then when you do the labs, they'll actually be uh, have elevated blood sugars or be pre-diabetics. So so the question is uh, kind of, um, there's two sides to it. So pre-diabetic means your blood sugars are too high and fasting pre numbers associated with pre-diabetes would be somewhere between 100 and 126. Now you're not called a pre-diabetic unless you know that the numbers are high, but some people have a lot of blood sugar fluctuation they have high levels, they have low levels, and it's sort of all over the place. And so once you start getting below a blood sugar of 75, and sometimes I have people get glucometers and measure because sometimes there's confusion. Are they dizzy and, and tremulous and shaky because their blood sugar is low or is it something else? So if it's dropping below 75, then that is could be too low for you. And the symptoms you would have is shakiness, kind of what happens when you skip a meal, headache, irritability, you want to fight with people, um, your, uh, maybe you'd have palpitations or tremors um, or tremulousness. Uh, so those are um, headache, 
those would be low blood sugar symptoms. And I ask, uh, in, a, in the ideal situation, you do not want to get to the point that you're having low blood sugar symptoms and you do not want to have high blood sugar symptoms. High blood sugar symptoms are you eat a meal and you're sleepy, you need to take a nap. Ideally, we want to balance the ratio of, of food so that you're not dropping down and you're not going over. So when you eat, you should be fine. You should not need to, you know, put your head down or take a nap. And so we would help you uh, by uh, working on how to balance the meal so that we avoid the lows and the highs. Okay, fantastic. Um, also, too, on the chat, uh, this uh, presentation is wonderful, great talk. Um, also, it will be recorded. Uh, Nick can tell us quickly. We can find that on the website, I imagine, and he can let us know. The next question is, is CRP included in standard lab work? Yeah, as I mentioned, sometimes, uh, a lot of times cardiologists might add it, sometimes rheumatologists add it to labs, but I, I don't know that all primary care doctors do it. Maybe I'd say 50% of the time I see it. So it is something that's easy to do. I use it as a screening and it's easy to ask for it to be added next time you have routine labs. And again, I advise usually going 10 to 12 hours fasting and really seeing if uh, you know all the numbers we talked about uh, are in optimal range. Okay. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. How accurate is BMI, especially when considering someone with a very muscular build? Yeah, yeah, there's, a, there's definitely shortcomings to uh, just using purely BMI because it's just based on weight uh, and height. So yes, it's not perfect. It is used in a lot of studies. Uh, and unfortunately, that's what we have to go by. But um, again, uh, if you have access and at the clinic, we do a body composition testing that's much, much more detailed. Um, it is a part of a, a, our new uh, patient visits and we really like to get specific and not just rely on the BMI because yes, if you're very muscular, then that's gonna have very different implications. So with the, with the more detailed body composition testing, we know exactly, even in your limbs and your trunk, if you have enough muscle or, uh, you, you know, or if you have a lot of belly fat, a lot of people are skinny, they look skinny on the outside, but they're fat on the inside. And so you can't always tell from just looking at a person. So yes, the, the, the body composition testing is much more accurate. Okay. Um, this presentation, uh, would it be available? Could you share this presentation is a question. The actual slides, would we be able to share the slides? Oh. Uh, not a problem for me. If you can figure out, I'm happy to share. I can take care of that. Um, thank you so much. Uh, let's see. Can you totally reverse diabetes is one of the questions here texting. Yeah, it, it sort of depends on what type and how advanced. Uh, so type two diabetes is the more common. Uh, what's a hallmark of that disease is more uh, insulin resistance. So uh, getting the weight down um, can be really effective in disease reversal. If you're talking about, and if type two diabetes is severe enough, you can start uh, affecting pancreatic cells and get to the point that you might need insulin. So it all kind of depends on, and for type one diabetics, that they're usually younger. Um, and if it just depends on the degree of damage. So the sooner, the earlier, type two diabetes is obviously easier to reverse. Uh, but again, type 1 diabetics, depending on the severity and the need for insulin, um, we try to work to minimize uh, extra medication. So again, depends on the specifics of each patient. Okay, great. So we've uh, had a great presentation. Uh, there's more questions. Again, if you have a question, uh, send it to me via text and send your email, and we will definitely get Dr. Vidat to answer that and get that back to you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I did put contact information in the chat, uh, but if you cannot access the chat or do not see it, please feel free to text me and I will get that to you. Thank you. We really appreciate your time and this fantastic information. Lots of comments here. Um, about the uh, presentation. Nick, do you have anything to share from the chamber? Would you like to update anybody on any activities? I'm sorry I didn't call on you initially, but if you have something. 
Uh, nothing specific. We have our next Get to Know Your Chamber on Tuesday the 26th from 9 to 10.30 a.m. where if you want more information about the chamber, whether you're a member and you want to know how to maximize using your benefits or you're not quite a member yet, but you're interested in maybe uh, a membership and how it might help you with in this new uh, within this new first sorry within this new year, then you might consider joining us for that. And then we have a whole list of um, events coming up, and then they're on our calendar, BeverlyHillsChamber.com. And thank you, Dr. Vadat. This is absolutely awesome information. Thank you for having me.